Welcome back to Take 5 Friday, where we talk the people and process behind making and maintaining the U.S. diplomatic presence around the world. This week, OBO's Director of External Affairs, Christine Fouché, is talking with Joseph N. Jemmy, Senior Curator within OBO's Office of Cultural Heritage. Joseph has over 20 years of museum and gallery experience inside and out of federal service, including roles as director and curator, redesigning and reopening the Avalon History Center, serving as chief registrar at the William Jefferson Clinton Presidential Library, and working on the cultural resource team that relocated Philadelphia's iconic Liberty Bell. Mr. Anjemi also has extensive hands-on working skills with statuary preservation and has served on numerous cultural resource disaster recovery teams. Today, he administers the preservation, care, and exhibitions of the Department of State's 18,500-piece cultural heritage collection worldwide and has played a major role in the installation of the new traveling exhibition in Morocco titled A Voice and Stone. We're very excited to have Joe with us today to chat about his career and his work on some of the more recent projects he's been involved in around the world. Welcome. Joseph and Jemmy, we are so glad to have you on Take 5 Friday this week. Um, uh, your contributions as a curator to OBO in the Department of State are the epitome of what we try to highlight here on Take 5 Friday, things that people might not know um, that we're doing around the world on behalf of the United States and democracy. So um, we're very glad to have you, and we're going to ask you, per usual, our sort of standard three questions, um, and we're very excited to learn more about what you do as a curator and some of your more recent projects um, that you've been working on around the world. Um, so first up is basically, maybe I want to ask, maybe you could tell us a little about what a curator is and how did you decide that you wanted to be one? <laughs> Thanks for having me, Christy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a great question. You know, I think my parents still ask me that one. What is it you do? <laughs> they don't always, they don't grab it. They know I work for the state department, but maybe that's it. You work in culture, right? Uh, so what is a curator? You know, it's a, it, it's a complicated question. I guess that's why people keep asking. It's not an easy one because a curator can be a lot of different things. There can be art curators, there can be history curators, there can be uh, culture curators. You know, there's, there's a thousand different kinds of curators. So I think that can be confusing to layman to the field. Uh, for me personally, I guess I uh, always wanted to be a storyteller. I thought at first that meant that I wanted to teach I, uh, I wet my feet in it a little bit. I thought I wanted to be a college professor maybe and teach cultural anthropology. I have degrees in that and history, but I've always kind of gravitated towards cultural anthropology and the people stories. That's kind of who I am. And everybody pushed me that way too in school. They're like, you got good grades. Here's the path you need to take. But I realized pretty quickly in teaching that it just wasn't the right, the, the right tool, the right mechanism for who I am as a person. So I started, I searched a little bit and fell, literally fell into museum work. And I realized that that's exactly who I kind of wanted to be, you know, as a person and, and work as a calling. You know, I look at the job as a calling, uh, using objects to tell stories about who we are as people, who we are as a nation, you know, from the big picture stories to the little ones, uh, objects can do that all for us one way or the other. And from there, I kind of never looked back. It was one museum job after another. I did try them all. I think that some, a lot of curators can be jack of all trades. That's kind of what my career turned out to be earlier in. I learned how to be a registrar to do inventory work. I learned how to be a fabricator to a lesser extent, you know, do the hands-on things in design. But curator, it speaks to who I am, just the, the pure design and the pure creating part is, is me. And 20 plus years later now, two decades later, here I am. Well, as a also another former uh, reformed uh, high school English teacher, I can appreciate the idea that we go to teaching because it seems like such a great place to make connections and tell stories. But you can really find that you can do this in other places too. Teachers outside of the classroom, maybe we'll call ourselves. Um, of all of the ways that a curator contributes to the community and to celebrating history, uh, how did you find the State Department, and how did you think that that would be a great fit? For, you know, for you in your career? Another, I think you guys keep asking the same questions because they're good questions. That's the, <laughs> that's the reason it's happening. Uh, 
I guess for me, it's like many roads traveled, you know, uh, there, there was a, a few d different agencies. I worked for the National Park Service at Independence Hall for a decade, really. And, and at one time I thought that would be a forever home because I'll always bleed green and gray. Uh, I believe in the mission and I was proud of the uniform and the badge. Uh, everything about it, it makes for a really great agency. I uh, dipped my feet in the waters of the National Archives and worked as the chief registrar at the uh, Clinton Presidential Library for a couple of years. Not quite as much me and a few other jobs along the way too. I, I uh, ran a little museum for six years where I was director and curator and everything. And you know, I think all those experiences together combined is what laid, led me to the State Department. Uh, when I finally saw the State Department, what enticed me was being able to talk about almost any point of history and almost any topic of history uh, and ultimately, where does American culture, you know, cross with whatever the, the local, local country is? Uh, that's the most exciting part of the job for me. And that's really, for me, as somebody who loves people in general, it was an easy sell. Nothing else really mattered besides being able to, to interact and tell these, these cross stories, really. So cool. And um, I'm sure, you know, given given that you've got this responsibility to help tell these stories around the world, you've got all kinds of projects you could tell us about. I know more recently um, you've just worked on, on a project for Morocco celebrating our 200th year in the American legation in Tangier. And um, I, I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about, about what that exhibit is and maybe the building, um, you know, that it's not a typical uh, maybe curated exhibit that you would do there, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about the place and, and what's in it. For sure, for sure. I'd also say, you know, kind of segueing back to that last question, like I couldn't have done this job 15 years ago. You know, it accumul it's accumulated knowledge and being able to understand culture in a different way as, you know, as a, as a grown adult now, I think is really what makes it more nuanced and rich to me. And I hope it shows in the exhibits. Uh, the exhibit you're referring to, Christy, the, uh, legation, the legation exhibit in Tangier, Kind of, it's a genesis of over two years now, which is a long end of a project. Usually I can turn around temporary exhibits in about a year. Uh, I do research, I do a little writing, I find out the topics, how I want the exhibit to be expressed. And then I make partnerships and figure out the logistics of getting stuff from point A to point B. Uh, and I know that depending on the size, I can do that in about a year for a project. But the legation is not that. It's a lot bigger of a topic and a lot bigger of a story in, in many ways. So a little over two years ago, I was at a workshop at the legation building in Tangier. And I got to experience this firsthand where America meets Morocco. And that's really what the legation is, still to a degree, although it's not our embassy anymore. But it's still where um, a lot of people see uh, the symbol of America in that building. So there's 200 years of these rich stories and rich objects uh, with the one caveat, the one bad thing of being it's a 200 year old building. And it's in the Medina, the oldest part of Tangier, which is a sea of 200 year old buildings. And it needs, it needs help. It needs solid help to you know, go another 200 years. So our office in cultural heritage is designed to help with that, but that's also within reason. You know, There is not this endless sea of being able to supply funding to support this. So sometimes these exhibits develop around the idea of how can we make an exhibition to work as a fundraiser, a tool to help raise things for the building. So that, that's sort of the satellite of it. And I went back to, to, when I came back to DC, I said, okay, what are these stories we're going to tell? How do we use the legation building as kind of the focus? Because for me, it's easy with small objects, personal objects that tell stories, but the legation's a building. Uh, it's, it's a monolith almost. How do we make that a living object in itself? So I thought a lot about it before I put pen to paper. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of thinking involved. And I thought, okay, what are the stories that are important to America? And obviously the State Department is, is the main push. And there's fascinating 200 years of history and 200 years of objects that exist. So I made some partnerships with our, our uh, sister organization in the Diplomacy Center and got some objects over really the last hundred years uh, that tell those stories. I also realized that uh, the war years, the World War II years, 
that everybody is just, Tangier has this romantic feel to it because it's the spy center of the world, really. And the legation was the focus for us as Americans as the spy center. The uh, OSS, the precursor to the CIA was born there. So I thought, you know, these are important stories to tell too. How did we grow up as a nation? And uh, I made a partnership with the CIA museum, really cool bunch of guys. And I got neat little objects that, that are tied to that story, like spy cameras that, you know, are matchbox size. Today, it's kind of funny. I challenge the visitor to say, you know, think of this object. Now think of your phone today. You know, what these two things are, technology, how it's changed in 75 years, it's immense. But at the time, that little camera was state of the art, you know. We also have objects from the first director of the OSS, William Donovan, the, the godfather wow. of really the CIA, which is pretty spectacular. And the other bits and pieces that, that kind of touch me the most, I think, are the stories of the arts. Uh, you know, that's always be near and dear to me. So I learned that America has had a love affair with Morocco, not just Tangier, not the legation, but the country of Morocco in general. Our artists have been going there for well over 100 years, like Mark Twain. He's the very first to, to visit. I even put one of his quotes up on the wall. There's a Twain quote in the exhibition space. Uh -huh. But great. from there, there's the beat generation and then the music of the jazz artist and rock artist. Uh, so I tried to grab objects through a partnership with the Hard Rock International that tell those little bits and pieces of stories. Like we have Jimi Hendrix objects there. We have Lady, a Lady Gaga object there. These people have these uh, relationships with Morocco in special ways. So uh, I think we captured it really well. We created these suitcase uh, display cases. I, when I was thinking about it, I thought I can put out plain cases, but the more I thought about it, I just kept kind of thinking of Americans in suitcases in Morocco, all these artists traveling by suitcase. And I thought, why not create suitcases that are actually display cases? So we actually made period suitcases into display cases, which I think turned out really cool. That's and amazing. thank you, thank you. I'm really proud of it. That's so great. And people can see this, right? Even if you're not in Morocco, it's traveling, but also there's a, the, a QZM code that we're gonna put in the chat function that they can go visit. For sure. Cases. One of the best things about it is being able to travel. So it's not hindered by just being in an embassy alone. The exhibit is in the National Library in Rabat right now. It'll be going to Foundation Slawi in Casablanca in October, and then back to HST to Main State next spring. So uh, yeah, this is a global exhibition, which you can imagine is a little harder than just one place because of logistics, really. Logistics make these things so much harder, but the payoff is so much bigger. I've realized at first I was kind of gun shy. I said, do we really want to do three cities on two continents? That's a, not going to be easy, but my boss put the challenge in front of me and, and we managed to do it. So uh, it's, a, it's a massive success right now. It's really exciting. And to partner with Hard Rock, I mean, what a way to, to bring the State Department into a whole new potential group of, of folks who might not even think about diplomacy as, as, as something at the forefront of what they do, but how music and all of America's culture really plays into our ability to make connections in other countries around the world. And you got it, Christy. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And, and Hard Rock sort of had an idea because they have these, you know, these uh, restaurants all over the world, you know. <laughs> they sort of understood. And when I approached them and was like, listen, this is real cultural diplomacy, the bell, I could see the bells ringing like, yes, please. How do we do this together? It's really exciting. Uh, and I'm, I'm really looking for, I already know that there are others in the, in the mix in the future. In, this isn't, it's not over with Morocco. So I know we'll look forward to celebrating those. And I know posts uh, are very excited. I'm sure they all are ready to have you come and make some amazing exhibition uh, about their relationship that, that they're working on there. Um, I think it, it, you know, in all of our take five things, we, we keep trying to, you know, showcase how um, OBO as you know, kind of owner operator for the US government around the world. Um, I think this is this is really the right way to say we are not just platform, but the stage for diplomacy and, and how we can showcase all of American know how and ingenuity and, uh, and, and freedom um, in such a wonderful collaborative way. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Christy. Thanks for tuning in for our 15th episode of Take 5 Friday. We hope you'll join us again next week. 
See you then.